Hello everyone and welcome to Who Wore It Better, the weekly segment in which I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. It was go home week for Survivor Series, which they kept telling you was the one and only time all year Raw and SmackDown would face off against each other. Well, we'll see how long they hold themselves to that. Let's begin. Starting off with Raw this week, I'm going to do things a little differently this time around. Uh, usually I just go match by match in order of the show, but uh, tonight I'm just going to talk about the things that I liked about Raw first, which was few and far between, then talk about some of my larger uh, grievances with this week's edition of Raw. Starting off with Chris Jericho overall, I thought he was great from the beginning stuff he did to the end. The segment he had backstage with Rollins and Strowman uh, presenting them the scarves, I thought was great. There was a moment where the camera zoomed in on Jericho and Rollins talking. I really was hoping the camera would pull out to reveal Strowman already wearing the scarf, uh, but unfortunately we didn't get that moment, which is sad. The goldberg Lesnar segment, I thought, was overall it was okay. The first few minutes of it were kind of awkward with Paul Hammond trying to say his thing and Goldberg just saying, shut up! Like, that was all he had to say. Goldberg sweating profusely throughout the whole segment. Uh, the wall of indie workers as the security, I thought that was kind of a nice little touch there. Uh, Paul Heyman, one thing I thought a few weeks ago when Paul Heyman in that infamous Minnesota promo when the crowd was cheering Lesnar when they were supposed to be, you know, cheering for Goldberg, you know, I mentioned during my review of that how Paul Heyman's voice kind of wavered and sounded like he was getting kind of intimidated by the aura of Goldberg. And I think on Monday night when Paul Heyman was trying to get his words out, he kind of repeated that. He kind of stammered. He, he sounded kind of nervous. And I thought it was kind of a nice callback to that moment there. I think that's kind of the vibe they were going for in Minnesota originally, but it didn't pan out because of the crowd reaction. But they did a good job dealing with that at Buffalo on Monday. So I think kudos to Paul Heyman on that. Then the big fight they have where Goldberg is fighting all the security guys. Then he and Lesnar had that stare down. And then in a moment that makes Goldberg look very strong, uh, Brock Lesnar walks away and he gets booed for that. The way they've booked it and it's just kind of that anything could happen mentality. We don't know, you know, it's like, I think logic says that Lesnar's probably gonna win at Survivor Series, but also the way they've been building it up, I mean, maybe Goldberg could win, but then again, maybe Randy Orton could have won, you know, it's sort of, and maybe Dean Ambrose could have won. It's those things where we get that hope built up and then you get knocked down in a very devious manner <laughs> come showtime. So we'll see what actually happens with the, with the match. Of the 18 or so tag team matches that Raw had on Monday night, I did like the finish of the final one they had, where it was Enzo and Cass and Anderson and Gallows taking on uh, Golden Truth and the Shining Stars, where Anderson and Gallows did the fake out where they were going to allow Enzo and Cass to do their double team finisher, but then uh, Anderson and Gallows just made the cover and they won the match for the whole thing. So that was kind of a funny moment. That was at the one high point in pretty much all the tag team matches we saw. And finally, the end segment of Raw on Monday night was a high for me. It was my favorite segment of the night. Too bad it took all three hours to get there. The big confrontation between Team Raw and Team SmackDown, the big fight happening there, and the Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins powerbombing AJ Styles out of the ring onto the whole mass of people on the outside was an amazing spot. Really cool stuff. It was overall the strongest of the night. And again, uh, my only regret, my only problem with it was it was the, you know, in the very end. Now let's go back to those tag team matches I was referring to earlier. All these different tag team matches we saw. There was uh, Kevin Owens and Roman Reigns versus Cesaro and Sheamus. There was Sasha and Charlotte versus Alicia Fox and Nia Jax. There was Enzo and Cass, Anderson and Gallows versus Golden Truth Shining Stars. All these different tag team matches where the whole theme was teammates fighting, teammates not getting along, but they have to coexist in Survivor Series. Look, Sheamus and Cesaro were already doing that gimmick for the last couple of months, and now you have everyone doing it and it just gets so repetitive I kept getting just so bored with what they were doing with the tag team stuff like I get it you know not every Survivor Series team throughout history has been a unified force there's always been a little bit of infighting sometimes uh, but this one to me just came off really thick and just annoying to how frequently they kept playing that up I felt like for better or for worse, or whether it was intentional or not, the team on SmackDown got along a lot better. Like, all the teams on SmackDown, the tag team stuff, the women's stuff. Also, in that six-man tag team match they had uh, between, you know, the New Day and Rollins, Jericho, and Strowman, you were kind of in a catch-22 situation where you didn't really want either team to lose, but somebody had to. On the one hand, you had, you know, the guys from the traditional Survivor Series match who have to look good uh, because they're the meat and potatoes, they're the stars of the division of Team Raw. Meanwhile, you have the tag team captains the New Day. And these guys have been losing a lot lately. They lost the week before Hell in a Cell to Cesaro and Sheamus. They almost lost the tag team titles the next week. They lost to Anderson and Gallows last week in Glasgow, and they lost again on Monday. That's not a very good look for this record-setting tag team, and it's a very weird departure from the team that has pretty much consistently been winning all the time. They put these two teams together, somebody had to lose. And, you know, the way I see it, I think you can make the case that Jericho and Strowman and Rollins had to be the ones winning. 
The last thing I'll talk about from Monday Night's Raw was the cruiserweight stuff. The, uh, the segment they had in the first hour backstage with Brian Kendrick addressing all the other cruiserweights. It was like the worst community theater I've ever seen. Just like bad acting from everyone involved. Like TJ Perkins, he's never been that great to begin with and he wasn't any better on Monday. Rich Swan with some very overly scripted stuff. Kendrick was eh, okay. Then you had Sin Cara walk in and you couldn't understand a word he was saying through the mask. It was also funny yet also sad. Then you had Brian Kendrick fighting Sin Cara in a match later on in the night. Uh, one thing that confused me, there was the whole pre-match beatdown that Kendrick gave to Sin Cara, and then they had a very long competitive match afterward. What was the point of doing the pre-match beatdown if you were just going to have a regular straight-up match afterward, immediately following, and they didn't really play up on that throughout the match? To me, that was kind of a weird booking decision. Uh, Kendrick wins after twisting Sin Cara's mask and uh, getting him with the captain's hook. Uh, in an ironic twist, and I'll talk about that later, Sin Cara, the, traditionally the one who did all the botching, even though that was the original Sin Cara, not the current one. Uh, no botches on Monday night, and Kalisto, his old partner, did some botching on Tuesday, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Before I go into SmackDown, I do want to talk about the State of the WWE Universe segment that they ran on the network immediately following Raw on Monday. That was a really weird thing. I Just watching the whole thing, I was like, what was the point of any of this? Like, it was just further hype for Survivor Series, yeah, but like, it came in all the wrong places. Like, Heyman was Heyman. He was great at the first five or six minutes of that segment. Then Stephanie and Foley, and then Shane and Daniel Bryan come in. And basically, the four of them just had this big argument. Like, you could tell that Stephanie and, to a lesser extent, Shane were trying to follow a script. But then you had Daniel Bryan and McFoley just trade barbs at each other the whole remaining 20 minutes of the bit. Daniel Bryan was saying that McFoley quit WWE to go to TNA in 2001. The timeline's off, but I think the intent was there. And he you know, accidentally calls Cesaro Claudio for a second. And, you know, Mick Foley, Jesus Christ, talk about watching a man's brain turn to mush in real time. That was scary. He was asked a simple question of, would you work with Daniel Bryan in the future? And then the lights went out. And it was just a really weird thing to see. Like, this segment, I think, like, when he's going unscripted, uh, as I think this segment was, like you could tell, like he kind of suffers now. Like it, it's sad to see. I think that like him as general manager, I think he's been kind of exposed. I think the luster of the magic of McFoley is kind of wearing off in this position. I think this segment he was kind of thrown to the wolves here. So in the end, did this whole half hour of blich that they just like splatted onto the network on Monday night? Did it really add anything? Did it really get you hyped up for Survivor Series? Did it make you want to buy the pay per view or buy a ticket to it? I mean, it didn't take anything away from it, but it didn't add anything to the hype either. I thought it was just kind of there. Like the Paul Heyman stuff, it was fine, but we've already heard from Heyman everything we need to know about the Goldberg Lesnar rivalry. Then you have the stuff with Shane and Stephanie and Daniel Bryan and McFoley. To me, it just didn't add anything to what we've already seen. Like we don't want to see the authority figures go at it. Who cares? Like, I think we've established as a fan base, we're really tired of seeing the authority figures at all, much less fighting against each other with no discernible payoff. It's just, it's just madness to me that they would do that and waste so much time doing that. Like I said, Stephanie was trying to, Stephanie was just an outlier in that whole segment. She was so overly scripted and everything she said seemed so overly prepared. Shane was just kind of in the middle. Then you have St you have Daniel Bryan and McFoley completely going off the rails. And McFoley is in no position to have a spur of the moment verbal sparring match with anyone, much less Daniel Bryan at this point. And in the end, the question is, what is the state of the WWE Universe? Was it answered? Was it addressed? Paul Heyman said the state of the WWE Universe is healthy because Brock Lesnar, which is not a sufficient answer in my opinion. So yeah, ultimately, this was a very bizarre thing they added on the network. Meanwhile, on SmackDown, boy, what a breath of fresh air this show was compared to Raw. Spoiler alert, SmackDown won this week, but I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, the show opens up with the Intercontinental title match. Dolph Ziggler versus The Miz. I'm not going to get into the details blow for blow because you, if you've seen these guys wrestle before, you know what they're capable of. But holy hell, this was a great match. Just great back and forth throughout. The match ended when Dolph Ziggler rolled The Miz up in the figure four. He counted the figure four into a roll up, but, the, but Maurice pushed The Miz on top of Ziggler, allowing him to win uh, in nefarious fashion to become the six-time Intercontinental Champion. More than all, name dropped Jeff Jarrett in the commentary, saying he was also a six-time champion, and that blew my mind. I never thought I'd hear Jeff Jarrett's name mentioned on WWE programming again, but yeah, The Miz wins, and it kind of like, in one way, it takes the piss out of Dolph Ziggler's emotional win at No Mercy when it was career versus title. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's like if he lost, if he lost to Sami Zayn at Survivor Series, that'd be even a lamer payoff. So 
if anyone could defeat Ziggler and take the title away from him after that big win, it would have been The Miz. So now we'll have The Miz and Sami Zayn Survivor Series. Curious to see what happens with that match. If Dolph Ziggler is going to try and interfere on Sami's behalf or something, who knows? I don't know. But yeah, great opening match for the 900th episode of SmackDown. NXT's Oni Lorcan debuting on SmackDown against Kalisto in singles action. I liked this. I liked the fact that they brought this NXT guy, who admittedly I don't know much about, but they brought him up in this kind of enhancement position. Uh, you know, not everybody who gets called up to NXT has to be a huge star coming in. Oh my God, this person's from NXT. Ah, it's amazing. Ah, every person I feel has been brought up from NXT in this big, glamorous way to, to some degrees, you know. But Oni Lorcan just showed up and just did the job in about a minute and a half. It would have been a minute if Kalisto didn't botch the spring board thing he did but uh, yeah only Lorcan looking really impressive in the first like 30 seconds of it just whomping the shit out of Kalisto then Kalisto comes back hits Slita Del Sol and wins back to my original thing about uh, Oni Lorcan being this, this kind of job guy from NXT I think that's fine I think it's like it's this it's the step between like just local talent and then like established guys who are just jobbing for the sake of jobbing but having a guy from NXT who hasn't really built that much of a reputation yet coming in and jobbing on Smackdown and Raw that's not the end of the world they can come back at a later date and be bigger then than they were before. So overall, I hope to see more NXT guys, like mid to lower level NXT guys, get the call up for like jobs and stuff. I hope that we see more of that across both brands. That's kind of my hope. I think that Oni Lorcan doing that is a great precedent. Nikki Bella versus Carmella. Like Ziggler Miz, it's the feud that's never going to die on SmackDown. These two fought for a while, and then Charlotte showed up. And I, there's one thing. I was talking with my friend R. Felix Finch, friend of the show, about this tonight. And he mentioned how it's, it's that common trope of like the wrestler who buys the ticket to sit in the front row. It's like, how ridiculous is that there's this packed show, and there happens to be one front row seat just available with this one ticket? I think it's a bit of a weird trope in wrestling. And it's kind of weird that it's still been going on for as long as it has. Nikki throws Charlotte in from over the barricade, they have a big fight, and then the rest of Team Raw comes in, the rest of Team SmackDown comes in, there's a big old lady fight, it was crazy stuff. Nia Jax eating the wall, <laughs> it was one of the funniest, most entertaining things I've seen all year, I thought that was great. And you see Naomi with the big springboard, uh, body press onto the whole gang of women and SmackDown stands tall in the segment. It was a really cool thing. That's like It's the first time we've seen that kind of interbrand big old women fight thing happen. We've seen it with the guys uh, but now we can see it with the ladies. I thought that was a really cool way to end the segment. The big 16-man tag team match. Good lord, it was Brizongo, American Alpha, the Hype Bros, and the Usos taking on the Ascension, the Vaude Villains, the Headbangers, and the Spirit Squad, aka the ones who didn't make Team SmackDown for Survivor Series. Uh, you know, everyone got to do something in this match. It was really cool to see. And another cool thing, you know, comparing this to Raw, where every tag team was like infighting, infighting, this one it was like there's a little bit of tension between one of the Usos and Jason Jordan, like over a tag. It was in the first minute of the match. And, like, that was it. The, they all got along still. They all got their stuff in. They all worked as a team. And like that was kind of nice and refreshing to see. I was dreading the worst when I was watching. Like, great, we're going to see more of this infighting all night on Tuesday. But no, we didn't see that. It was really cool. So anyway, the match ends when the Usos go flying over the top rope onto everyone in the ring. And then you've got uh, American Alpha winning the match for the team by defeating the Headbangers. So that was fun. I mean, it's one of those things where it could go either way. Either it goes super fast and everyone gets like one spot in or it gets a little longer like this one did. And I think this match accomplished what it needed to. Everyone got to look good, even the ones who lost. So I think, yeah, it was, it was a fine 16-man tag team match. Also, I forgot to mention the return of King Booker earlier in the night addressing the SmackDown tag teams was a very nice touch. I did appreciate that. Finally, Edge comes out looking nothing at all like he did in those promotional pictures. The short hair is gone, the clean shaven is gone. He looks like a caveman now. Uh, he comes out, great use of Tony Chimmel, announcing him as the Rated R Superstar. That was hilarious. It was took me back. It was great stuff. And they have the cutting edge. Edge starts introducing Team SmackDown. It was kind of fascinating to see that this is the first time all night we saw those five SmackDown guys. So members of Team SmackDown are arguing a bit. Then out comes The Undertaker, the, the big, much ballyhooed return of The Undertaker for the first time in three and a half years on SmackDown. Really cool moment. And then the promo he cut was very interesting. He said that WrestleMania would no longer define him. He was back, you know, taking souls, digging graves, whatever the hell he said. Is he going to be another kind of like just third party authority figure on SmackDown because he, he talked about he's laying down the law like you better not lose Team SmackDown or you have to deal with me so very interesting to see what they're going to do with The Undertaker here and what capacity he'll be in from here on out. Scoreboard!
Just stepping back and looking at the big picture for both shows this week, the question is, did each show properly promote Survivor Series? I think the answer to that question is yes. Both shows, in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, did an effective job promoting Survivor Series, letting you know what's happening, letting you know what's at stake. My biggest problem with Raw was they just like kept beating the dead horse of the infighting and, oh my God, how are they going to coexist? And it just went on and on and on for three hours in so many different varieties, the whole thing with the tag teams and the thing with the women and the thing with the traditional stuff, like all this infighting, just so boring and so repetitive. Meanwhile, on SmackDown, they had almost none of that element. They had a little bit of it and then it was over and done with and that was it. And that alone put SmackDown over the top this week compared to Raw, but then you have a great opening match with Miz and Ziggler. They are always capable of tearing the house down. They did it again. Uh, you know, the great stuff with the women in the middle of the show. Uh, Taker coming out. You can't beat a show with Edge and Undertaker coming back. I mean, that's just simple math, folks. And so, yeah, this week, SmackDown wins for who wore it better. I think that was kind of obvious just watching Raw, not even looking at SmackDown. You knew that SmackDown could not do worse <laughs> than Raw. So, folks, what do you think of Raw and SmackDown this week? Let me know in the comments section below. And don't forget to vote for what show you thought won this week in the poll on the upper right hand corner of your screen. This Friday, Jay Biggs and I are going to break down the Survivor Series card match by match, give our analysis and our predictions for the show as we are now want to do for the big four pay-per-views. That's kind of what we'll be doing, the WrestleMania, Royal Rumble, SummerSlam, Survivor Series. We want to keep it with the big four with our prediction videos. We don't want to just flood the channel with prediction videos for all the B pay-per-views that we're probably going to be dead wrong with anyway. So we're just going to stick with the big four uh, from here on out. But anyway, stay tuned for that and also uh, the winner of the t-shirt design contest I haven't made that officially in the video yet until now the winner of the contest is Dan Madeline with his great poster design that is now available at prowrestlingtees.com slash wrestling with regret so be sure to check that out as well so be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it and subscribe to wrestling with regret while you're at it I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time